this is um, impact of materials on society module and the focus of this presentation is on new uh, type of metals um, we call amorphous metals they are also called uh, metallic glass uh, which means it's a it has some properties of a metal and some properties of a glass so i will explain in next few slides um, what is the meaning of a metallic glass so let's um, start with um, small introduction about what a metallic glass uh, is. So metallic glass is essentially a metallic alloy which has more than one metal um, and it has a structure like a glass. Now most of the solids can be um, classified into two different types depending on their um, atomic arrangement. Either they are crystalline solids or they are amorphous solids. So Glasses fall under the category of amorphous solids, um, but most of the metals which we know, they are actually crystalline. So the difference between uh, amorphous and crystalline solid is essentially the way their building blocks, you know, atoms, molecules, or ions are arranged. So if you look at um, this slide, the arrangement for a crystalline metal, the picture on the lower part of this slide is is how the atoms are arranged in a crystalline metal. You can easily identify that the atoms are arranged in a very regular pattern. Um, but in contrast, if you look for um, the upper picture, which is which is uh, arrangement of molecules for a glass, there is no regular pattern. So the molecules are um, packed in a random fashion. There is no periodicity which we can identify. So this difference in in arrangement of atoms or molecules or ions can actually strongly affect the properties of a material. Now, um, we know glasses and and metals very well because metals and glasses have been actually part of our, our society for a, for a long time. Um, you can find examples of glasses and metals almost everywhere. If you look in in, in your office, in your car, or aeroplane, you can find examples uh, for the parts made from glasses and metals. And from that uses, we know um, know a lot about glasses and metals actually uh, separately. We know glasses are fragile, they break easily, but um, whereas metals are more malleable, we can easily deform them, we can reshape them, and glasses are extremely hard. They are not, they cannot be easily scratched. But whereas metals are relatively soft, so if you take a sharp knife, you can easily, easily scratch a metal. The another uh, useful properties, property of glasses is their transparency. They don't have any color, so we can easily see through glasses. That's why we use glasses for, for windows. But metals have a unique color and they are okay. We can see through. So the visible light is not transmitted through through metals and metals are very good uh, electrical and thermal conductors that's why most of the most of our, our electrical cables they are made from copper which is which is a metal and they're also good thermal conductors for example if you take a take a um, take a metallic piece and heat one end uh, of a metal the other end will be at the same temperature very quickly but but in opposite, uh, glasses are insulators. They, their electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity is not is not that great. Right? So we, that's why we use uh, glasses for insulating uh, purposes. Now the question is that, and the intriguing question here is that if we take a metallic um, element like copper, nickel, aluminum, or any of other metals, and we change its atomic arrangement from crystalline to amorphous like glasses how do the properties change so that's that's the third column here which i have uh, intentionally left blank we want to fill that um, column by our knowledge of glasses and metals how will the properties of a metallic glass would be which has metallic elements and arrangement of atoms is more like glasses now uh, let's look at um, First, the mechanical response of a metallic glass. So if we compare stress versus um, strain curve of a metallic glass with a crystalline metal, um, which is stainless steel here, 
you can you can see a strikingly different behavior. So what we have here is that on y-axis we have a stress which is um, which is load divided by the area of cross action. So if you take a cylinder of a metallic glass or a steel and then you apply load, then stress will be given by the applied load divided by the area of that cross section of a cylinder. And on x-axis we have a strain which is the change in length of this um, cylinder in this case we call the amount of deformation. So change in length divided by the original length that gives the extent of deformation that material is undergoing. Now if you in the case of crystalline uh, metal steel when we when the stress reaches around 900 to 1000 megapascal the steel starts to deform permanently. Right? So the maximum elastic strain which can be achieved in stainless steel is about 0.5%. So if we apply stress higher than 1000 megapascal the shape of that steel cylinder will change permanently. And but in in the case of metallic glass metallic glasses can withstand actually much higher stress. So the the stress is almost twice that of a steel and the elastic strain is almost four times than crystalline steel. Now so they have a very high strength, very high elastic strain limit. What does that mean? High strength and high strain limit actually translates into large elastic strain energy. And so if you click on, on this link provided here, this will take you to a very uh, nice short demonstration about the difference in elastic strain energy for amorphous and crystalline metals. So in the explanation for that video is, is here. So what you would have seen in that video is that there are two identical, um, there are three identical steel balls which are dropped on three surfaces. Two of them are crystalline metal. One is stainless steel and another, another one is titanium. And third one is a metallic glass or amorphous metal. In video that is referred as liquid metal, that's a trade name uh, for metallic glass sold by um, liquid metal technology, which is commercial uh, supplier of these uh, materials. Now, you would have noticed that in the case of um, the steel balls dropped on crystalline surfaces, the, um, they bounced a couple of times and then they very quickly came to, came to rest. So they stopped very quickly. But in the case of um, amorphous metal, the steel ball kept bouncing for an extended um, duration and also it bounced uh, very very high so the the difference in in that behavior actually can be explained if you look in look at the atomic structure of crystalline and amorphous metals which is um, schematically depicted here in the lower part of the slide for most of the crystalline metals um, we have what we call grains um, so though most of the practical crystalline metals are composed of grains and grain boundaries. Uh, grain boundaries um, are type of a crystalline defect. Right? So, so grains are essentially joined at regions which we call grain boundaries and they have a higher energy. So in the case of crystalline metal when a steel ball hits, part of that energy is actually transferred to the crystalline base which is used in rearranging these defects. Right, so part of that energy is lost, dissipated in the, in the base, and the rest of the energy is transferred back to the ball, and that's why um, with every bounce, some part of the energy is lost, and eventually um, whole energy is consumed in the, in the base metal, and that steel ball comes through that. But in, in contrast, in, in amorphous metal, there are no such defects like grain boundaries. So most of the energy, impact energy, is actually stored in the material and it's transferred back to the ball. And that's where it bounces higher and it keeps bouncing for, a, for an extended um, amount of time. Now, now that's, um, that's the reason that um, these metallic glasses are actually very springy. So they, they have a lot of application where you uh, want to store elastic energy um, as a mechanical energy. Now, the um, next um, next 
part we can we can look at the effect of these um, different atomic structure on other properties. So that was mechanical property. Now here I have um, zoomed in version of grain boundaries here. Um, again on the left hand side we have a crystalline metal where we have two different grains, grain one and grain two. And the shaded region um, between these two grains is grain boundaries. These grain boundaries um, have a higher energy because the atoms in, in the grain boundaries are actually misoriented uh, with respect to the, the individual grains. Um, so these grain boundaries um, are actually very prone to corrosion. So if you expose a material with grain boundaries to, to chemicals, they, they react. So that causes actually lower corrosion resistance. There is um, another crystalline defect which I didn't show in the last slide. So here you can see is what we call dislocation. So even inside inside a grain, there um, there can be an extra plane of atoms, or there can be a missing plane of atoms. Those are called dislocation. So similar to grain boundaries, these dislocations also have higher energy, and they all contribute to the plastic deformation, which you saw on the last slide, and also they contribute to the corrosion. Now, in amorphous metals, um, as I said, we don't have um, such defects like grain boundaries and dislocation, and that translates into very high corrosion resistance. And metallic glasses or amorphous metals are also extremely hard, which actually results in a very, very high wear resistance. And since we don't have um, defects, that also ref is reflected in the surface finish. So, so the attractive um, properties of amorphous versus crystalline metals is that uh, amorphous metals have high corrosion and wear resistance, and their surface finish is extremely smooth. Now, the other properties of interest are um, their um, their optical appearance. In in terms of optical appearance, actually, the amorphous metals look very similar to crystalline metals. They are not transparent; they are opaque, um, and they're also good thermal and electrical conductors. And the reason uh, for this similarity uh, for the optical, thermal, and electrical properties is that the amorphous metals have similar atomic bonding like crystalline metals. They also have a lot of um, free electrons, valence electrons. And so the properties which are, um, which are predominantly dictated by atomic bonding or electrons, um, they don't change much when you go from crystalline to amorphous structure. Okay, so now we can um, fill the third column which I had left um, vacant on, on, on previous slide. We can, we, we know how metallic glasses behave in terms of uh, mechanical response, electric and thermal response. Uh, metallic glasses are very springy. They have very elastic strain energy. They are extremely hard, which is um, similar to the glasses. They are opaque, like crystalline metals, and they are good electrical and thermal conductors. So they have that's the reason we call um, they are a bit of um, metal and glass because they have some properties which are similar to crystalline uh, metals, and other properties are similar to glasses, which um, which stem from their atomic arrangement, amorphous atomic arrangement. Now, um, so till this, um, we we understand. Um, now a lot about metallic glasses. Now um, the question is, how do we how do we make a metallic glass? If we have a crystalline metal and we want to make a metallic glass, there are um, there are a lot of different techniques which can be used to make a metallic glass. But the most commonly used method is what we call rapid cooling. Rapid cooling from a liquid state. So um, rapid cooling of a metallic glass can be understood from um, from this volume versus temperature graph here, which is uh, uh, which is shown on this slide. On y-axis we have a volume, and on x-axis we have temperature. And if we take a metal and heat above its melting temperature, which is Tm on x-axis, then it becomes liquid. Now, if we start from liquid and cool it depending on how fast we cool, we can actually make either amorphous structure or a crystalline structure. If we cool slowly, then as soon as we reach melting temperature Tm, 
um, this liquid solidifies into a crystalline state, which is a um, blue line on the bottom, and we end up with a uh, polycrystalline or grains, uh, which is shown here for a crystalline metal. But if we um, cool liquid very fast, we can actually prevent this um, crystallization, and then we um, we follow this red line. Um, and the liquid is cooled below the melting temperature. That's what we call undercooled liquid. So it's still a liquid, but now it exists below its melting temperature. And if we continue doing that, eventually we reach temperature, what we call glass transition temperature. And at that temperature, the atoms are actually um, locked into the structure. So the atoms can move anymore. And the resulting structure is amorphous solid or a glass. Um, so, as I said, the metallic glasses are nothing but it's a it's a um, it's an alloy, metallic alloy, which has a structure of 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 a glass. Okay. Now, the, the the question is that how fast we actually need to cool. By by fast cooling, we can actually prevent crystallization. But the question is how quickly we need to cool. Um, it turns out that it depends on the chemistry. Um, so here I have three different examples. Uh, one is extreme. If we take a pure metal, single element, and another extreme example is if we have multi-elements, like four or five elements. Um, so single element material, if we want to prevent crystallization, it needs to be cooled at almost billion degrees per second. So even billion degrees per second may not be sufficient to prevent crystallization, and if we if we add another um, another metal which has a slightly different size and chemical affinity, then it turns out that we can actually decrease this uh, required cooling rate by uh, almost like ten thousand times. So going from single element to two element alloy, the cooling rate required cooling rate to prevent crystallization actually decreases quite a lot. And this trend uh, continues. And for um, five element, which is the, the last example here, um, that can be cooled at a um, cooling rate almost like 10 Kelvin per second. 10 degrees per second would be sufficient to, to prevent crystallization. And we will have amorphous solid or a metallic glass. Now, this um, change in cooling rate is actually reflected in um, how large sample we can make. If we have to cool it fast, then we can do that only for thin samples or small samples. If we can cool it slowly, we can actually make large samples as reflected um, on these pictures. Uh, for two element alloy, we could make only thin tapes. But for five element alloy, we can now really make um, bulk cylinders. So um, this is also um, another point which I won't mention. Um, in, in literature, you may also find instead of metallic glass, they are referred as bulk metallic glass. So bulk is essentially added um, for an alloy which can be cooled into amorphous structure um, with a size larger than one millimeter. All right, so um, now the next, next question on which we have to address is we have a metallic glass. Now, how do we make actual parts? Because, for example, as I said, metallic glasses are very springy. Now, if you want to make actual spring for applications, um, how do we get? How do we do that? Uh, in crystalline metals, we know we can use machining, um, but but unfortunately, then machining doesn't work uh, for amorphous metals because amorphous metals are are extremely hard. They are extremely strong. So, if we use uh, machine tools, they have to be harder than than amorphous metal in order to to do any um, viable machining. We also can't use hammer, which we typically use in crystalline metals, because this material is also brittle, like a glass. It will shatter into the pieces. Now, um, so that's that's a major challenge that we can make metallic glass, but how do we actually make the parts out of them? We we know in glasses actually um, window glass, for example, we have seen a lot of intricate shapes uh, made from a window glass. Right? So we know that glasses actually can be shaped into all sort of um, intricate shapes by using their what we call viscous molding. So if you heat 
a window glass you can draw into a very thin fiber we can make um, hollow bottles now can we do a um, similar process with glossy metals and it turns out that actually we can so metallic glasses um, can be molded into into complicated shapes by similar technique which we use for window glass so um, this is on this slide, I have um, described the principle which, which is used for um, reshaping of metallic glasses. So what we have here is uh, this red color um, box is a mold, which is template, which can be made from any rigid material, um, silicon, alumina, or any other metal. Then we put a disk of amorphous metal, metallic glass on top of that, and then we heat this entire assembly to a temperature higher than the glass transition temperature of metallic glass. So at that temperature, metallic glass actually starts flowing like, um, like almost like a viscous uh, liquid. So if we apply a little bit of pressure, this metallic glass will fill into the mold cavity. So by this technique, actually, we can uh, make any size and any shape um, from a metallic glass. So in the next few slides, I'm going to show a couple of examples which um, for the parts which have been made by using this technique. So um, the first example here, which you see here, is a is a hollow bottle, a um, hollow bottle made from a metallic glass. It's a seamless. There is no join here. It's a, just a one-piece hollow bottle. Most of the um, metal cans or bottles which you see, they are actually joined. But this one is a single piece. And second example, which you see on on the right hand side here, is uh, from a tiny um, gear, which is um, of the size of ten human hair. So it's really, really small, and it has a lot of uh, intricate parts, uh, very sharp teeth, sharp corners inside. And the last example, which you see, are uh, pillars. Which one pillar is almost thousand times thinner than, than a human hair. So, so the message here is that metallic glasses actually can be molded on, molded on um, any length scale starting from nano to a macroscopic, uh, like a bar here. Um, so, so now um, the question which um, is the most important question is that um, why don't we see metallic glasses in, in the consumer market? They have very good uh, properties and we can shape them. So why don't we actually see them? So these uh, next two or three slides will, will explain what are the um, potential applications and what are the roadblocks which we have to overcome before we can actually start using them. So let's look at the first property, which is um, high elastic energy, so which makes metallic glasses um, ideal candidate for um, applications which need springs or hinges. So um, some of these applications are in sporting goods, for example, a golf club head. We want to have a golf club head, head which can actually transfer most of the impact energy to the ball rather than deforming the uh, material of the head. So some prototypes from metallic glasses have been made and they have been tested. And it turns out they outperform the existing titanium-based um, golf club heads. The, the issue here is the more economic issue. The cost of the material is still very high because it uses expensive, expensive metals compared to titanium or steel or any other crystalline metal. So um, if we have a metallic glass made from inexpensive metals, uh, sporting goods would be actually an um, ideal application for metallic glasses because of their elastic, uh, large elastic strain energy. Other applications um, include small hinges, which, which, um, which we need to bend multiple times. So since metallic glasses, they have a large elastic strain energy, they can be bent to a smaller curvature, as, as, as it is um, shown here on the lower example. It's a small hinge made of a metallic glass, and it can be bent almost um, by 360 degrees. And this can be done repeatedly over and over again. Nothing happens to this material. Um, the next, um, next property of metallic glasses is actually in 
and precision tools because they can be shaped into um, really precise, tiny shapes as you see in these, uh, this picture here. It has a lot of different parts, um, small tweezers, scalpel, membrane, gear, springs. All of them have been made by just one step process um, by molding into, into a template. And they, there is no subsequent processing required. Now, since the material cost is not an issue here because the amount of material used is not that very high, um, the main issue here is the cost of the template. Currently used templates are not reusable. So once you use a mold, you have to make new mold, which um, significantly increase the cost of the part. So the challenge here is to, to develop a mold which is reusable, which does not stick to a metallic glass so that you can use again and again. That will that will significantly reduce the the cost of the final part. And this one uh, next application uh, actually projected application is in the static industry because as I said amorphous metals they have a very smooth surface finish which is um, very attractive to jewelry um, and watchmakers. Uh, there actually um, has been has been um, an effort from Omega. Um, Omega is trying to use metallic glasses for watch bezel. So if you click on this this video, this will take you um, to to Omega website, and they there's a short video on describing how they are using metallic glasses for uh, watch bezels. The other applications um, where we need smooth surface finish and uh, wear resistance is in electronic casing. So if there are a lot of um, big companies which are exploring metallic glasses for those applications. Um, the, 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 the issue, the challenge which needs to be overcome again is the deal cost um, and their reliability. There are also um, some more functional application. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a very recent work where a platinum-based metallic glass um, is being explored for fuel cell catalysts. We know platinum is a very good catalyst for fuel cell, but the property which is required for fuel cell catalysts is, is very high surface area, which is durable um, for the lifetime of fuel cell. So it has been shown that metallic glass, which is based on platinum-based um, metal, actually can be um, the surface area of platinum-based metallic glass being increased by simple molding on a nanoscale, and that uh, surface area is very durable. Even after 1,000 cycle, cycles, it retains almost like 90% of its surface area compared to um, conventional catalyst, which actually loses 90% of its surface area after 1,000 cycles. So this is, um, this is a very... Um, very attractive application because this doesn't need a lot of material and um, and its surface area can be increased in, in a very simple simple way. Um, so um, the, the nature of um, metals has actually fascinated um, mankind for centuries. Um, if you, you will see that um, um, the prehistorical ages have been actually characterized by the type of the metals they were used. Um, so the 21st century is actually the metallic glasses are um, predicted to be a new advanced uh, class of material. Um, but before we actually place metallic glasses in this, um, in this category, there are some economic and material challenges which need to be overcome. I have listed a um, few of those challenges which are, the, um, which are the most important ones. One is that we have to develop um, new alloys which are made from less expensive metals, not like platinum or gold. Um, instead of that, we have to develop metallic glasses based on copper or iron, aluminum, um, the metals which are abundant and which are less expensive. Second is that um, the current method of finding metallic glasses is very labor intensive and time consuming. We have to develop new methods where we can quickly screen um, which system is actually a good glass follower. 
on third part is that we have to develop new fabrication techniques where we can make metallic glass parts in a reliable way. Um, so that seems to be a big issue for commercial um, applications. Um, the fourth is um, is related to if we want to use metallic glasses for for precision tool industry by using molding, we need to we need to uh, find materials for reusable molds, uh, which will which will lower the cost of um, final product. So there's a lot of um, research being done all over the world um, about these issues, and um, I am very optimistic that in, in, in the next 10 years, we will um, see metallic glasses in the consumer market. Uh, thank you very much for listening.